This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Good morning. Let's get started, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 21 this morning. Matthew chapter 21. As you're turning there, uh, I'll introduce the sermon a bit here. Uh, This is the clash of kingdoms. When Jesus comes, his first attack wasn't on Rome, but on religion. And we're going to, this morning in this morning's sermon, go through uh, a large, broad scoping view of the book of Matthew to see how this narrative fits in to the big picture. But Jesus has already previously presented uh, that the kingdom he's presenting is not like any earthly kingdom. And yet, in this book, and yet in this chapter, the conflict between kingdoms is going to get underway. Matthew chapter 21, let's read it together. Um, Follow along as I read, and and we'll start with verse 1, and we'll read down through verse... uh, 17. Matthew chapter 21. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into a village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and the occult, the fold of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put them on, uh, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of the Naz- of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came, to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And they said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them, and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we look at this text of Scripture, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to truth. Would we see you as high and lifted up? Would we see the clash of kingdoms here? And would we side with you and your kingdom? And would that kingdom rule and reign in our hearts and live and be active in our lives? We ask that you bless our time to follow. Convict us where we need convicted. Open our hearts and minds to what you have for us. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. So as I said, we're going to dive in here a bit to the big picture of the book of Matthew as we look at this chapter. Now, Matthew as a book of the Bible 
it's really a story without a beginning. It's the first book in our New Testament, and it really int- it brings in the whole New Testament. It is the book that connects it, the New Testament, strongly to the Old Testament in the way it's written. Not that the other go- go- not that the other gospels don't, uh, but the point I'm making here is the Old Testament is a story without an ending, and the New Testament is a story without a beginning. The Old Testament prophesies and predicts of this Son of Man that will come, who will be, who will take away the sin of the world. This Messiah figure, all the way back to Genesis three, and with the garden and and getting kicked out of the garden, uh, there would be one coming from the seed of the woman who would defeat this serpent figure. Now, you thought, well, maybe. David would be the serpent crusher. Maybe it's Moses. Maybe it's, and as you go through the Old Testament, character after character after character, there's always, even in the midst of great victory, even in the midst of great movements forward, there's always failure and sin and a flaw. And so, looking maybe to David as the king of Israel, the first king, the the king, the man after God's own heart, He still was corrupted and flawed by sin. And so the New Testament picks up where the Old Testament ends in that the Old Testament ended, they were looking, they were longing, they were waiting for that prophet that never came. And 400 some years of silence have occurred, whether we call that the intertestamental period or the second temple period, those years have passed, they've waited, they've longed, And no Messiah is here. Then comes on to the scene in the New Testament, Jesus, who begins to carry forward that story. Jesus, who in his ministry does specific and certain things, making people realize and think and, and, and take note that, hey, maybe this is that Messiah figure. And ultimately proving and showing he is the one to deal with sin. So Matthew connects these two testaments he he moves the storyline forward and he begins all this uh, in his book with the genealogy and and it's very exciting um and i say that somewhat sarcastically because in our culture we don't we don't find genealogies exciting but we begin right away to have this connection to the old testament before we jump into some of that even matthew's going to depict jesus in in three major ways one he's the messiah from the line of David, he's the one to come. He's the, the one that's been promised. He's going to be pictured here as the new Moses, the new teacher, dispenser of the law with teaching and truth for God's people. And thirdly, he's going to be God with us, Emmanuel. He will be God dwelling with us. Humans cannot and have not and will not ever be able to do and live the way God has called them to. So God sends his own son to do it, to live, to deal with the sin problem and make a way of freedom for us to move forward. The first three chapters begins with this genealogy. We have Abraham and David. Uh, We see this line all the way connected to Jesus. There's a little bit of hope here. Well, maybe he's the one. Within these chapters also, we have the birth narrative of Jesus. And right away with the birth of the Messiah, with the birth of of Christ, we we see miraculous things happening. We see these wise men coming from afar. They're following the star to Bethlehem. We have a virgin birth. We have all these ties into the Old Testament and Old Testament prophecies. And in essence, we have Emmanuel. This is God with us us. God is stepping onto the stage of human history in a physical, tangible way that is not short-term like when he appeared in the Old Testament, but it's going to be long-term. He's going to live on this earth for 30-some years. Matthew then moves uh, after connecting these dots with Jesus is Messiah and he's God with us. He then moves in to really equate or to make a, a image or simile with Moses and Jesus. Jesus is the new Moses. And to kind of bring this into perspective, Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and Jesus came out of Egypt. Moses crossed the Red Sea. 
Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, he went through the waters. Moses had 40 years of wandering in the desert. Jesus went through 40 days of fasting in the desert. Moses received the law from God, whereas Jesus gives the law from God. Or, And both of them do those events on mountains. Jesus with uh, the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount, as well as uh, not just the Sermon on the Mount, but even the, the Transfiguration when he reveals himself to his uh, disciples. And even there with the Transfiguration, Moses came off the mountain, his face shone, Jesus shone on the Transfiguration. But Matthew doesn't stop there. He makes it very clear Jesus is greater than Moses. Moses delivered from slavery. Moses gave new divine teaching, but Jesus delivered or saved from sin and initiated a new covenant, and a covenant where now God is really on both sides of the equation, working on our behalf and working uh, to satisfy his own wrath and justice. Uh, God is on both sides of the equation, making this covenant work. So the next section of the book of Matthew takes this idea of Jesus as the new Moses, and it, it does something really cool with it. It makes it into five little sections, which might bring your mind back to the five books of Moses. And so we'll look at each of these briefly and, and dive into the one that, that we're looking at here this morning. In the first section, we have this Sermon on the Mount. It's the announcement of God's kingdom, that God, he has a rescue operation for the world. He's going to confront evil and re restore God's reign. He's going to create a new family, uh, a, a family to live out God's kingdom. And we read this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, and it, it's it's very shocking to, to the Jews and Pharisees and leaders at the time because nobody can live this. And that's part of the point. Nobody can on their own. And he's confronting the, the religious system in his preaching, but Overall, they, they realize they need transformed hearts. This is an upside-down kingdom. It's not like anything they expect or think. Uh, they need transformed hearts. Uh, and this is really the, the teaching on the Sermon on the Mount really um, brings this together. And this is a very, very new uh, teaching. Uh, this is just not anything you would hear, have heard in, in Judaism of that day. The next section, Jesus then begins to bring the kingdom into people's lives. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, in this section, we have nine uh, miracles, nine events that happen where it's a healing of a leper or a centurion servant or the sick mother or the paralytic man or the mute man or the different, the demonized man or calming the stormy seas. We see him enacting miracles and twice within these narratives, he says, follow me, follow me me. And this section ends and culminates with him sending out the 12 in chapter 10, and they are to do what he has been doing. They're to cast out demons, they're to heal the sick, they're to preach the gospel of the kingdom, and they're sent out to do what he did. And people were to accept instead of reject, and, and, and there's even, you know, if, if they reject you, shake off the shoes of your feet and, and get out of Dodge, leave town. This section leads to a, a third section here where we really have different people pitted and how do they respond to Jesus. You have some positively responding to Jesus, some who are affirming that he is the Messiah, he's the long-awaited one. You have others like John the Baptist who they're honestly, they're just quite not sure what to do with this Jesus figure. John the Baptist, you may remember, yes, he, he was the forerunner of Christ. Yes, he preached Christ. Yes, he baptized Christ. And then he's sitting in prison going, is he really the Messiah? And he sends some of his disciples over and says, hey, is this guy really the Messiah? And Jesus' response is, these are the things I'm doing. Go tell John that and let him decide if I'm Messiah or not. So John, even his own family, they're, they're like, mm, we're not so sure. I mean, think about it. if you were James, the brother of Jesus, you grew up with this kid. You know his foibles and trouble, and you know you know all of the things of his life. You played with him as a boy, and you're like, okay, Jesus, are you off your deep end? You know, you're claiming to be the Son of God. You're claiming this. You're claiming that. Um, Jesus, uh, I I grew up with you. You know, so his family at one point, 
even are trying to get him to quiet down. So there's those who are neutral, and then there's those who are flat out negative. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the rulers in the temple, they want nothing to do with it. The next section here is a section um, that leads to where we will be today. So with these different perceptions of who Jesus is, we also have different perceptions in chapters 14 to 20 of what the Messiah would be about and what he would do. You have non-Jewish people recognizing Jesus is the Messiah, and you have the Jews on a whole denying him as Messiah. You have Jesus asking that question to his disciples, whom do you say that I am? And the the, the common perception was the Messiah would be a ruling and victorious king that defeats the nations and the pagans and establishes his order and his dominion and his power and he will rule. That is the perception. And we get they get that from like Psalms 2 and Daniel 2. But Jesus begins teaching that, yes, yes, that's, that's, um, that's a, a part of the Messiah thing, but um, we're going to have to suffer. And Jesus is teaching from Isaiah 53 where the servant must suffer and die on behalf of his people. And again, this is back to the upside down kingdom. This, this is backwards from everything you would anticipate and expect. This is radical to them. So the Pharisees view the Messiah as a victorious conquering king. The disciples have this in view. And so... Some have misunderstood who Jesus is, and almost all have misunderstood what the Messiah would be about. That leads us then to this section we're dealing with in chapter 21, where we have a clash of kingdoms. Jesus enters riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, the city of God, God's hometown, you could say. It's, it's the established city where God would dwell with his people in the Old Testament. He then asserts his authority by casting the money changers out of the temple. And that's really the story we'll, we'll dive in today. And he offends them and they ultimately decide to kill him. And in these chapters, he critiques the Pharisees and calls them hypocrites. And they're the ones who lead him to the cross and pave that path. But that's the path that must be taken to establish a new Jerusalem. We've gone this far through the book of Matthew. Uh, it would be a shame if I didn't close off the book before we dive into our section here this morning. So uh, in regards to that, the last section then after this clash of kingdoms in chapter 21 to 25, we see uh, Jesus institutes the new Passover. You could say the the um, communion, the Lord's Supper. He institutes that. Um, he then is taken by the high priest, abused, put on trial. So he suffers. He dies. He's buried. He's the suffering servant. And he rises again the third day, victorious over sin, death, and hell. And he invites you and me into that new life. Uh, the graphics used here, I should make a comment here. This is from a group called the Bible Project. Um, they do a really good job with a lot of Bible layout. Uh, they have a whole video channel. Um, I wouldn't agree with everything they have to say, uh, but they do they do a good job seeking to explain the Bible in, in ways that are good and simple to understand. And I think um, if you want a resource, that would be a helpful one. So we're looking here at this last book of Moses. Oh, no, it's not a book of Moses. This last section in these five books of Matthew, you know, mimicking the book of Moses, uh, where we have this clash of kingdoms. And let's talk about this here. If you were to become the president of the United States, what would be the first thing you would do? What would be the first change you would make? Maybe put on a more local level. If you were now the mayor of Guernsey, what changes would you instill right away? What would you get working on first? I think that's a helpful question to set up this phase because Christ enters with the triumphal entry Palm Sunday as it's been known to be called through history with the laying down of the palm trees palm branches what would you call what would you do first 
Jesus enters the city and the first thing he does is he goes to the temple. Verse 12, there we read, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money chambers, changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Jesus' first act as he's I mean, no one has placed him in authority and power. He is God. He is in authority and power. His first act is to go to the temple. And when he arrives there, they're buying and selling and the money changers are at work. Uh, he's presenting himself as Messiah and he's acting like it. Matthew describes this cleansing of the temple immediately after his triumphal entry. Now, in the book of Mark, he points out that the cleansing actually took place the next day. Um, on on the on the Monday, but Mark then places the cursing of the fig tree at the start uh, of his second day. So um, anyway, the, the the way these authors are writing this, they're they're writing with a purpose and a reason. And Matthew's trying to get you to see that hey, this is the top of the agenda with what Christ is doing. He's going to cleanse the temple. He's moving in. Now this is not something that maybe should have been foreign to them of the concept of Messiah coming in to cleanse the temple. If Messiah is God with us, where's the house of God? Where would Messiah be interested? He'd be interested in his own house, the house of God. So, back in Malachi, there we read, he says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom he seeks shall suddenly come to his temple. The messenger may be pointing here to, to John the Baptist, and then he'll, he'll suddenly come to his temple. The text here goes on, Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Them shall he, then, excuse me, shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, and in the day, days of old as in the former years. So here there's the refining process that the Messiah would put the temple through. I don't think this is only referring here to the, the entry of Christ at the temple in the New Testament. I think this probably will happen in the future again. But the temple system's been polluted. And Jesus is coming to clean house and, and settle things up and get things right. He's the Messiah. It's his house. He's associating himself with God, saying it's his house. And he's cleaning house. Now, it deserves a few moments here of... of just contemplation on what's happening in the temple. Here you have buying and selling. Animals could be brought to the temple, but some have noted they were likely to be rejected. How this would work was if you traveled a long distance with an animal, you didn't have a nice uh, cart or pickup to throw the animal in and take them along. You took them by foot and you might journey for several days to get there. And if something happened along the way or the animal um, received an injury or an, an, a beast or something took and, and killed it or whatnot, you'd be out of a sacrifice. So it was common to try to, to go to Jerusalem and buy a, a sacrifice uh, to, to pay for it there uh, because of the, the difficulties of travel. So the animals could be bought. It was a convenience thing. But what would happen with this buying and selling of these animals was they would deny your animal for sacrifice, pointing out some blemish that they perceived. You would then be forced, and your hand would be forced to, to buy a sacrifice from them. And they conveniently had a group of lambs or whatnot for sacrifice that these have been pre-approved. We've already went through the process of checking them out, and you can just take one of these and it would be good to go. So they would sell you this lamb, and then after you had left... They would, uh, well, oh, we need to reconsider this lamb we just bought from this fellow. Oh, yeah, it, it that's not a blemish. That's just a piece of dirt. We can clean that off. Oh, it's good. Let's, it would now, that lamb would now go into the, the pen of pre approved animals. So they're making a racket off the sacrificial system. They then also had money changing happening. 
part of this, there's different discussion on why this happened, uh, but the coins maybe they had heathen symbols on them, so maybe it was the the heathen symbols you couldn't use those in the temple or and, and whatever. There there was something going on here where they said you had to use temple currency. So you know how it is if you go to get a bank or whatever to get some foreign money and exchange rate. You don't get a straight one for one exchange. You even whatever the exchange rate is, there's a fee on top. So these people are trying to buy their animals. They don't have the money. They they have to then get their money changed. So they get charged a fee there. Then they get abused on the animal process, and round and round and round this process goes. And as I was thinking about this this week, I, I couldn't help but think: Could you imagine being a Roman soldier that was a guard at the temple? I mean, just think about it. This is not your history. This is not your people. This is not your culture. You're watching these Jews do this religious thing. You're watching these religious leaders who you see the simple, the, the peasants, you see people who come to them and they they believe these men are holy. They believe these men are, are servants of God. They are looking to these men as religious leaders and examples and guides and and these men are running this racket and you're watching them. Could you imagine the testimony this made to the Romans? You now, the Romans probably didn't care. They probably thought it was funny. They probably would have just enjoyed it, it standing back and watching this happen. But this is the racket that's taking place in the temple. This is the... the the, the corruption of the evil system, the, the religious system has been turned into a money-making profiteering. And sadly, this has happened again and again in church history. You may wonder at times why people shy away from organized religion or shy away from a church. Shy, they shy away because they've seen this in the past. It doesn't take long of reading church history to find that like the Catholic Church would sell indulgences, pay off your sins and get get this person into heaven or, you know, get them out of purgatory. Get this person here. Well, you give us money. We'll, we'll do this. Or at times when the Catholic Church has an agenda, as we were reading in Fox's Book of Martyrs, you can get six months free sin. You, you can be all your sins for six months, no matter what they are, can be forgiven if you go kill this group of Christians or this or that. You see the church doing the same thing the Pharisees were doing here. And we must be careful not to do that, not to turn the system, not to turn our worship into a racket. And so there's been preachers through history who've done this, and there's been churches who've done this, and we must be careful not to do that. We also must be careful with those who've been offended by this, not to offend them more. We need to pray for them. We need to seek to to lead them back to the Lord. We, we need to invite them. We need to try to show them the way it should be, not the way it has been for some. But this religious racketeering was evil. Isaiah um, 56, 7 reads, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Jesus has tied this next verse in to what Isaiah said, because he says, this is not written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. All this business activity outside, and business is not wrong, and buying and selling is not wrong, and, and maybe having the convenience of an animal in case yours got sacrificed, that's not necessarily wrong. But the distraction of the bazaar outside, how, how do you pray with all that going on? When there's the animals making noise, and the people heckling, and back and forth, and, and all this, how do, you, how do you have a house of prayer? And notice it was a house of prayer for all people. All people. Everyone. I think in the next section, as we kind of move on to this passage, that becomes a point because the Jews had made this, yes, a house of buying and selling and worshiping of God, but this is our Jewish temple. 
There were plaques posted that if you were a Gentile and you came past a certain point, you were not you were not free to be there. And so if a Jew kills you, it's your fault, not theirs. So they, they were the Jews had isolated themselves from the world around them. Whereas even their Old Testament prophets said, hey, this is going to be a place where all people come. The next phrase here in verse 13 refers to the den of thieves, which comes from Jeremiah 7. This is my house, which is called by my name. Is this my house, excuse me, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. The temple was not fulfilling its God-ordained role as a witness to the nation. Or nation, excuse me. It had become, like the first temple, the premier symbol of superstitious belief that God would protect and rally his people irrespective of their conformity to his will. Unless the message becomes the temple will therefore be destroyed. Let me unpack that. The, they had this superstitious belief that as long as they had the temple, they were protected, they were good. God wouldn't allow them to be destroyed. How did that work the first time, guys? Back in Isaiah and Jeremiah's day, the false prophets were saying, we have the temple, we have the ark. No one can, can defeat us. No one can come against us. God is with us. And God allowed them to be overrun because of their sin, because of their rejection of him, because their abuses of his system. God allowed them to be taken out by Assyria and Babylon. God allowed them to experience the wrath and anger because of their sin. Conformity to God's will is more important than having a building or a symbol or an icon or whatever it is. What God wants people to rally behind is himself, not simply a symbol. God wanted all nations to come and rally there, all nations to pray, and they've turned it into a den of thieves. How often do you and I do the same thing? God gives us so many good things. He gives us access to himself. He gives us blessings, blessings of physical nature, blessings of a spiritual nature. He brings the rain. He brings the snow. He brings the warm sunshine. He brings all of this. And how often can we turn it to evil? It's not wrong to enjoy nature and fishing and maybe golfing and those things. But are you enjoying that when you should be in the house of God? It's not wrong to fellowship and enjoy with family, but has family become something that trumps what happens at the house of God? Now, I, I, I want to be fair here. I've seen churches go so far the other way that families don't have time to themselves if they're fully plugged in with the church. Okay, that's wrong too. But the, the point I'm making is we can take these good things that God has given to us and we can let them become the idol. Instead of looking at them as a blessing from God, we turn them into an idol that we, we work for those things. We work so we can have them, so we can enjoy them. We, we want to live for those things and we forget to live for God. Next verse here in verse 14 of our section. Jesus heals the blind man. You say, well, well, how does this tie in? What's going on here? Because he's casting out the money chambers. He's cleaning out the temple. What's this healing of the blind man have to do with anything? Well, what's happening here is the temple was a sacred space. It was a space where God lived and God dwelt. So they had to protect it and keep it pure and keep it holy. Most Jewish authorities at the time would forbid a lame person or blind or deaf or mute from offering a sacrifice and appearing before Yahweh in the temple because they are crippled. There, there's, a, there's a malady. There's something wrong with them. And they're trying to protect this sacred space. You may remember some of the Old Testament laws in Leviticus where if, a, if you touch a dead body, you now become unclean and you're unfit. You're unable to enter into the holy space. You're unable, not the holy of holies, but you're able, unable to go into the temple because you're unclean. It doesn't mean you're sinful. I mean, you take a bath, you wait a few days, you offer a sacrifice and you're good, you're good to go. But the point is the dead thing has defiled the living thing. 
the Qumran community with the, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they wanted to go so far as to actually exclude cripples from their congregation and from the, the, their community. They're trying to protect the holy space. Here's Christ. He's better than the temple. These humans have to push out other humans to defend and keep the temple from becoming defiled. But here's Jesus. He touches them. He embraces them. He heals them. And a greater one than the temple is here. A greater one than the temple is here. Why? Well, the temple could be defiled, but Jesus, just like the dead body contaminates the living, the opposite is now true with Jesus. The living, true word of God walking in flesh. Now, when he touches the sick, the lame, the leper, they are now healed. It's going the other way. The cleansing of the temple and these healing miracles are jointly declaring Christ's super superiority over the temple. He is more important than the temple. He is more important than that authority. And the children begin to praise him and call out Hosanna in the highest. And, and, and as they're doing this, the Pharisees get annoyed because the children are doing this. And they tell Jesus as if he's responsible to stop it. Can't you stop these kids? And Jesus quotes Psalm 8 too, where he says, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfect or excuse me, ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. He's being critiqued for these children's praise, and he responds with this quote The kids get it, but the religious leaders don't. And this quotation affirms and confirms that the humble perceive spiritual truths more readily than the sophisticated. The Pharisees were tripping over their own religious system. Yeah, the same guys who had part to do with the money changers and the, the, the racket at the temple. And so we're here we have the big picture of the book of Matthew coming in. There's a clash of kingdoms. And when Jesus comes, he's presented in his teaching. He's shown what, uh, what a new kingdom is like. People aren't sure what to think. They're not sure about who the Messiah should be or what he should be like. They, they have perceptions that are wrong. He comes in after teaching, after showing, after explaining, after all this. He comes on the scene. There's a clash of kingdoms. And at the end, he's put to death. Because his way doesn't fit with their way. Folks, have you put to death the will of God in your life because it doesn't fit with your will? When God brings judgment, he doesn't start with the pagans. He starts with his people. Judgment begins with the house of God. It begins with God's people. Peter makes mention of this. He says in 1 Peter 4, For the time has come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. If it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? We may look at our country and we may look at the problems we're facing and we may want to blame those who are living in sin. We may want to blame uh, the greedy capitalist bankers. We may want to blame the homosexuals for where our society is. We may want to blame the atheists and the God-haters. We may want to blame all sorts of people for how they're living in sin and they're 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 pushing that agenda and, and they are, are, are just tearing our country down. But folks, if God were to come today and judge our nation, he's not going to the White House. He's going to God's house. Let that sink in. He starts with the house of God. I believe it was Mark Twain who said, it's not the things I don't understand in the Bible that bother me, it's the things I do understand. Although he's not a theologian, there's a great point to be made there. 
Have you abused the religious system? Do you use your religiosity to get out of things, to get out of helping your neighbor, to get out of caring for others? Do you use your religious whatever as a get-out-of-jail-free card? There's a lot of language in the New Testament of justification. And I've been dwelling and thinking and, and reading on some of this lately. And James has talked about this. He says, hey, faith without works is dead. Do we need justified before God as a believer? No, because we are justified. How are we justified? By faith alone in Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is nothing I do to earn my salvation because everything I need for my salvation has been done on the cross by Jesus Christ. It is Christianity is not a religion of do, it is a religion of done. It's finished, it's completed, it's over. Jesus has made the way possible, and God knows it, and it's on the books of heaven, and he knows when we exercise our faith in him that we are united to Christ, and we are part of his family. God knows it all. But what about your neighbor? What justifies you before God is your faith in Jesus Christ. But what justifies you to your neighbor? You see them, they go to church every Sunday. But have you watched the way they do this or that? I can't believe that. That's so rude. That's insensitive. That's taking advantage of the system. That is this or that is that. And as your neighbor perceives you, does it justify the fact that you're a child of God? Is how you're living out your Christian life proving to your neighbor that you are living out the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount? Placing others first, putting the kingdom of God first, living radically different than the world. Does Is that how you live and is that what's put on display? Or is it rather, yeah, he's just working the system. Yeah, he says this, but really, I mean... Folks, judgment's going to begin at the house of God. It begins with us. We must be so careful to walk as God has walked, not to turn the blessings of God into idols, not to profane the name of God and how we live, not to carry the name of the Lord in vain, not to use God to promote our selfish interests. This happens within the church, and James makes comment of this in, in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we should receive the greater condemnation. Hey, be careful to be teaching and telling everybody what, what they should do and what ought not to do, because you're going to be under a greater condemnation. Not that it's an evil thing, but that you're held to a higher standard. If you want to reach this world, if you want to reach your neighbor, you better start living like you're in Jesus' kingdom and not the kingdom of this world. Remember that Roman soldier standing, watching the sacrifices, watching the money changers, watching the, the same lamb that gets denied for sacrifice be turned around and used for the next person for a sacrifice? Is there someone who's looking at your life the same way that Roman soldier was looking at the temple sacrificial system? Judgment begins with God's people. How will you respond? Lord, we thank you for this text of scripture. And as Jesus has moved in here, asserted his authority in the temple, asserted his how he's greater than the temple, and, and really shown uh, that he, 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 unlike the temple, can not be defiled. He actually cleanses us. Lord, enable us this week to live according to your kingdom, according to your rule, would we live in a way that our faith is justified, not in the sight of God, but in the sight of our neighbors. Yes, this in your son's name. Amen.